Hello and welcome Cross Assembly family to the latest installment of our Groups Digital 242 series. This series is where we one, gather in Christian community just like you're doing right now, two, grow and build each other as disciples of Jesus, and three, serve by sending spiritually filled agents for local and global transformation. I want to thank you guys for joining us now and turn it over to today's teaching. Tonight we're going to talk about communion because uh, we're trying to get into this thing that when we start uh, a new 242 round, we start with communion. And so tonight, that's what we're going to do. And I want you to get your study guides if you would, because I want to talk for a few minutes about how we see the crucifixion in the Old Testament before Jesus even came on the scene, how we see even communion in the Old Testament before Jesus came on the scene and uh, instituted it. Um, I, I like Chuck Missler. Y'all familiar, anybody here familiar with Chuck Missler? M-I-S-S-L-E-R. He was a brilliant, um, I guess, engineer. And uh, he used that engineering background that he had to, to do some really in-depth Bible studies. And I like what he said. He said, when you start to read the Bible, even though it was written over about a 2,000 year period, 66 different books, different backgrounds, he said, it's very obvious that the Bible was put together by some type of a super intelligent being that stands outside of our, our, uh, our, our space-time continuum. And of course, we believe that superhuman being is God. He is the one that put this together. But um, Jesus, to kind of give you a frame of reference, Abraham was 2000 B.C., okay? This just kind of helps with Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, Abraham was 2000 B.C., David was about a thousand BC. Then Jesus comes, for all intents and purposes, zero. Actually, probably more like two or three uh, uh, BC. And then now we're two thousand AD. Okay, so now we're kind of going before the time of Jesus Christ. And Jesus actually says something interesting in Luke twenty four twenty seven. So this is after he's been crucified, raised from the dead. It's before he ascends into heaven. Jesus appears to some disciples. And he says, look at this, then Jesus took them through the writings of, of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So here's what he says. Even though the Old Testament was written before me, God, who stands outside of our space-time continuum, put in parts of the Old Testament that were a foreshadowing of me, my crucifixion, and even something like communion. And so let me give you some examples of how we see Jesus in the Old Testament. And the first one still blows my mind, and some of y'all have already heard me talk about this before, but uh, we'll put the chart up in just a second when we get through, but uh, don't, don't put the chart up uh, right yet. In Genesis chapter 5, you have the gospel of Jesus all the way back in Genesis chapter 5. Now, this actually precedes Abraham. So now we are now talking like three, 4,000 B.C. The Israelites are in the desert for 40 years. Every time they pack up and they go to another campsite, God says, I've told you very specifically how to camp. Okay, so for 40 years they had to do this. Well, these tribes go to the north, those tribes go to the south, these tribes go to the... Anybody know what, what was in the middle of the camp? Anybody remember? The tabernacle, that's right. Now, that may not mean a lot to you, but scholars have put together the numbers of the tribes and this camped here and that camped here, and if you were to do an aerial view of the Israelite encampment for 40 years in the desert, here's what it would look like from, from the air. I think we got a picture of this. That's what it would look like. And what's in the very middle? The tabernacle. In John chapter 1, 14, it literally says this, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Isn't that a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, you see the cross even in the Old Testament. Let me give you another example of this. The Passover lamb. You know, God is very specific. This is before Jesus comes to earth. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God is very specific on how the Lamb is supposed to be sacrificed. For example, His bones cannot be broken. John says very clearly, Jesus' bones were not broken at the cross. The two uh, thieves on either side, their bones were broken. Jesus' wasn't. And then the Jewish Mishnah, 
The Jewish Mishnah is Jewish rabbinical teachings that aren't in the Bible. The Jewish Mishnah even goes into greater detail as to how the lamb is supposed to be sacrificed. And did you know this? The lamb could not be boiled. Did you know that? Do you know how you cook the lamb? It had to be roasted over fire. Fire in the Old Testament represents the judgment of God. So the lamb is roasted over a fire. But the Jewish Mishnah, now these are not Christians, you understand these are Jews, are very specific on how you're to fillet the lamb, what kind of skewers you're supposed to use. In fact, Joseph Tabori, who is an Orthodox rabbi, he is not a Christian, he is a professor at Bar Ilan University in Israel. This is not a Christian. Said, if you look at the way the Mishnah tells Jewish people, to sacrifice their lamb and to roast the lamb and you put a skewer through the top and a skewer through the middle he says quote it seems obvious that in Jerusalem the sacrificial lamb was offered in a manner which resembled a crucifixion in other words if you are to sacrifice a lamb the way the Jewish rabbis tell you to sacrifice that lamb and then to roast that lamb with skewers Here's what it looks like. Look at this. Isn't that amazing? What does that look like? It looks like the cross. Even in the Old Testament, thousands of years before Jesus Christ comes on the scene, the Jews are sacrificing their lambs, and they are roasting their lambs in a way that looks eerily like somebody hanging on a cross. And that's Old Testament. Let me give you another example. Genesis chapter 14. Um, Abraham has a meeting with a shadowy figure the book of Hebrews talks about right outside of Jerusalem. In those days, it's not called Jerusalem. It's called Salem. And this is 2000 BC. Abraham meets the shadowy figure and the shadowy figure, anybody know who's, what his name is? His name is Melchizedek. Melchizedek, the king of Salem. It's very interesting. Salem means peace. Melchizedek, Melach means king. Tzadok means righteousness. So Melchizedek literally means the king of righteousness, the king of peace. Who does that sound like? And this individual meets Abraham. And do you know what he offers Abraham at this meeting? It says in Genesis 14, 18, then Melchizedek, Melach Zedok, the king of righteousness, the king of Salem, the king of peace, brought out bread and wine he was priest of god most high in the book of hebrew book of genesis two thousand years before jesus there is a prophetic picture of jesus christ the king of righteousness the king of peace comes and says take and eat this is my body this is my juice my bread my wine isn't that amazing again you see jesus and the cross all over the old testament let me give you a couple more examples of this we keep going genesis chapter 40 Um, Genesis 40 is the part of the Old Testament where a man named Joseph, y'all heard of Joseph, is brought to the scene. Now, Joseph would have been about uh, like 1900 B.C. So this is still 1900 years before Jesus Christ. Joseph, I believe, is the strongest prophetic picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Scholars say that there are over 60 parallels between Jesus and and Joseph. For example, Jesus, like Joseph, was uniquely loved by his father. Jesus, like Joseph, was rejected by his own people, his own brothers, John 1 11. Joseph was sold for silver. What was Jesus betrayed for? Silver. Jesus, like Joseph, was reported dead, but came back. Genesis 37, 42, 47, 48 said every knee bowed before Joseph when he was elevated into the number two man in Egypt. Just like Philippians says every knee will bow before Jesus Christ. Joseph wore an expensive robe. Skip Hijack was talking about scholars, Hebrew scholars who said, yes, this robe that Jesus, that Joseph wore was an expensive robe. But there is some Hebrew language that says it may have been a seamless robe. Who else wore an expensive, seamless robe, according to John? Jesus. And so you got 60 parallels between Jesus and Joseph. But in Genesis chapter 40, you remember this story? Joseph is in prison, okay? 
and he's, he's been uh, uh, unjustly accused. He's thrown into this prison. Life isn't fair. He's a righteous young man who did the right thing, and as a result, he gets thrown into prison. And then when he's in prison, he meets two men. One is the wine bearer of the Pharaoh, and the other is the bread maker of the Pharaoh. And they say, Joseph, we have these dreams. Can you interpret the dream? Have you read this story before? And Joseph interprets the dream of the wine bearer and the bread maker. And in chapter 40, verse 18, Joseph says, now this drama is going to be, now watch this, here he says, this drama is going to unfold over the next three days. How many days was Jesus in the tomb? Three days. Uh, uh, Genesis 40, verse 19. Here's what Joseph said. The bread maker will be hung on a tree and his body will be broken. That is the first time in the Bible we see somebody who is hung on a tree. He says the birds will come and destroy, break your body. Bread, you will be you will be hung on a tree and your body will be broken. And a cupbearer, you will live. And through that wine, Joseph eventually has access to the king. This is, I think, possibly a very shadowy prophetic picture that Joseph, who represents Jesus, and by virtue of that, the people of God, the bread is broken on the tree, and yet through the wine, we now have access to the king, just like Joseph eventually was released from prison and gained access to the king. Does that make sense? Let me give you another one here. If you look at the Jewish bread that's used in, uh, now this, forget about Christianity for just a second. This is what's used in the Jewish Passover. Anybody know what the bread is called that they use? It's called what? Matzah. I can't remember if we have pictures of this or not. But before Jesus, this precedes Jesus Christ, the Jewish rabbis said, all right, according to Scripture, there's no leaven. Leaven or yeast in the Bible represents sin. Who is sinless? Jesus Christ. And the rabbis said this, the bread will be pierced. Do you see the piercings in it? And the bread will be striped. And if you were to ask Jewish rabbis, why is it that for millennia, your people have pierced and striped the bread? You know what they would say? We don't know. We've just always done it that way before. Well, you and I know why. Because Isaiah has a picture of Jesus Christ and says he will be pierced for our transgressions and by his what? Stripes we are healed. And to take it a little bit further, I don't know, we actually have some people from Jewish backgrounds that go to our church and I asked them to this. I said, this is true? They said, yes. They said, during the Jewish Passover, again, forget about Christianity, the Jewish Passover, that bread is broken into three parts. The middle part at the beginning of the Passover is taken and hidden and there's a time of mourning at the Passover. At the end of the Passover, the youngest child at the Passover is told, go and find that piece of bread that was hidden. That bread that was hidden was wrapped in a cloth napkin. And that bread is found, the young person unwraps it from that cloth napkin, it's brought back together with the other two pieces, and now there's rejoicing. And scholars think that it may have been that middle piece, that hidden piece that Jesus broke and said, this is my body which is broken for you. One bread, one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. For three days Jesus is taken away and hidden and there was mourning. And when he came back, there was rejoicing. Even in the Jewish Passover, before Jesus Christ, you see Jesus. He is all over the Old Testament. And so this evening, when y'all take communion... I, I don't want it to be, we just do it because we do it, blah, blah, blah. I want you to see the power that's in communion. This is so powerful that for 2,000 years plus before Jesus Christ, God was preaching the cross, the body, the blood, communion. This is powerful in the eyes of God. Now, I've said this before. I, I personally, and I could be wrong about this, and I would not do a whole doctrine on this thing. I personally believe that there is healing power in communion. I believe that. You said, Chad, why do you believe that? Just a couple of things. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight through 30 says that communion taken negatively impacts us negatively. Have you read that before? 
Paul says, because some of y'all are being flippant about communion, that's why some of you have gotten sick and died. In other words, when you don't take this in a worthy manner, it has negative ramifications on your body. Okay, I, I believe what Paul's saying. But then can the opposite be true? If it's taken properly, can there be positive physical effects on our body? Um, Another reason why I believe that there could be power, healing power in communion, is there are two elements. Bread symbolizes the body of Jesus. Juice symbolizes the blood of Jesus. Christ's blood is for spiritual healing. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of what? Sin. That's spiritual healing. Leviticus 17, 11, the blood of the lamb will make atonement for the soul or the spirit. There is spiritual healing in the blood of Jesus. I'm going to say this. You don't have to walk in condemnation, in guilt, in this feeling of, of filthiness and unworthiness because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. So there is spiritual healing in the blood of Jesus. But the Bible is very clear about this. Christ's body is for physical healing. Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes, we are what? Healed. Now, here's what skeptics will say. Yeah, we're healed. We're healed spiritually. That's not talking about physical healing. Well, tell Matthew that. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, Matthew's seen Jesus supernaturally heal all these people. And Matthew just stands back. And Matthew says, as I'm seeing Jesus heal all these people, I'm reminded of what Isaiah said, by his stripes we are healed. Matthew did not spiritualize this. Matthew said, the physical healing that I saw Jesus do is a prophetic fulfillment of Isaiah, by his stripes on his body we are healed. You with me on that? And so I believe the blood is for spiritual healing and the body is for physical healing. And there are, look, if that freaks you out too much, you do understand that uh, here. I, so I get in trouble with the Baptists because I took this book too literally. Okay, this is one of the reasons I got run out. Well, not run out, but kindly asked to leave the Baptist Church is because I'm like, well, if it's in the Bible, it's got to be true. Okay, well, there's parts of the Bible that make us really uncomfortable. Did you know the Bible makes it very clear that there are times that God will listen. He will uh, funnel His healing power through physical objects. I know you got to be careful with this, but we see, and we have a picture of this, in the Old Testament, remember, the people of God were bitten by snakes, and they're dying, and what does God say to do? He says, make a bronze snake, put it up, and when people are bitten, when they just look at that snake, they'll be healed. That's God using a physical object to mediate his spiritual healing power. Naaman, remember the story of Naaman? He has leprosy. What does the prophet tell him to do? Go bathe in the Jordan River. Those of y'all who have been to Israel with me, you are always disappointed when you see the Jordan River because it's like, I'm trying to think what river, it's not even as big as the Noose River out here. It's a, it's a small little muddy river. But God says, no, I'm going to mediate my healing power through that muddy river called the Jordan River. A physical object was used by God to mediate his healing power. Jesus, in John chapter 9, verse 6, you've heard me talk about this before, he there's a blind man, and that man's like, I want to see. And so what does Jesus do? <laughs> Spits, makes a little mud pie out of that, and puts it on the guy's eyes and said, no, go wash. Now, was there some kind of magic in that clay? No. It's Jesus that healed, but he chose to use a physical object to mediate his healing power. And for some of y'all, you've heard me share this before. How many of y'all... I know he's Jesus, but how many of y'all that story kind of grosses you out a little bit? He uses spit mud to heal a guy's eye, you know? So what's going on here? Oh, the, one of the times we went to Israel, we actually had an eye surgeon go with us. And here's what he told me. He says, you know, John says that blind man was born blind. As an eye surgeon, we realize if somebody is born blind, that means that there is no optic nerve going from their eyeball to their brain. If a man born blind is going to see that an optic nerve has got to be created out of nothing. When's the last time you see somebody creating something out of dirt? In the Old Testament, you see the God of the universe creating Adam and Eve, Adam out of the dirt of the ground, and it's almost like Jesus is saying, that same God who created a human being out of dirt now creates an optic nerve out of this dirt. It's the same God. 
But my point is this. A physical object was used by God to mediate his healing power. And you see this as well in, in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, people are sick. And what does Paul do? It says he would touch handkerchiefs. And those handkerchiefs would be put on sick people and they'd be made well. That's in your Bible before you call me Benny Hinn or whoever. That's in your Bible. Paul would touch handkerchiefs and they'd be placed on people. Notice this. Paul didn't say it's going to be 99, 95, uh, you know, uh, 59, 99 if you order on TV today. No, he never charged for his healing power. Okay. Can I give you more, one more example? James chapter five. If you are sick, call the elders of the church and they'll anoint you with what? Oil. oil. Is there healing power in the oil? Absolutely not. It's God mediating his healing power through that. So let's go back full circle here. So that's why I believe it is possible that at times, if God wants to, he can choose to release his healing power even through something as seemingly mundane as bread and, and juice. Okay? But here's the big reason while we're doing what we're doing tonight in just a few moments, while we're going to ask table leaders and folks at home to lead their people in communion. Here's the big reason. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this so you won't forget me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is, cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you do it, so you don't forget about me. So I believe there's healing power. I believe communion brings us together. I believe it's, all that's good. But that's the big reason we're about to do what we're about to do. Because Jesus says, what I'm about to go through on the cross is so painful, so horrible. I don't want you all to ever forget what this salvation you're enjoying, enjoying right now cost me. And I shared this a little while back. Um, the second church I ever pastored, there was a, an Episcopal priest that pastored in the same area. And he was old-time Episcopal, still believed in the Bible, still believed in salvation by grace through faith. He was a, he's a great guy. And he was a, a, a D-Day survivor. He was there at D-Day. His name was John Fitzgerald. And, uh, you know, I was into, still into war movies and army movies and that uh, whole, uh, what's that movie? Saving Private Ryan had just come out, you know, and I'd just seen that. And so I remember talking to him. I said, man, you were there at D-Day? He said, yeah. He said, I was on, on one of the first waves that came in. I said, how old are you? He was 18 years old. And I asked him, I said, w were you afraid? And his answer was very interesting. He said, Chad, it's very strange. I was only 18 years old. I can't believe I've thought this in depth. He said, as I stood on the, the bow of that ship, seeing the cliffs ahead, I was not afraid of dying. Isn't that crazy? He said, I wasn't afraid of dying. He said, here's what I was afraid of. I was afraid that as an 18-year-old, I get shot and killed, and 50 years from now, people would forget that I ever even lived. That I'd make this sacrifice, and 50 years later, people just forgot the sacrifice. He said, I was afraid of being forgotten. And, and allow me to read maybe a little bit of humanity into what Jesus says there in that 1 Corinthian passage. I wonder if that night before he died, that human part of Jesus said, I'm concerned that they're going to enjoy their salvation and enjoy going to church and enjoy the fact they're going to heaven, but I'm concerned they're going to forget me. And I don't want you to ever forget me. And I don't want you to ever forget the battle I fought for you and the bullet I took for you and the sacrifice I made for you. That's why I'm giving you communion, the bread and the juice. And in a few moments, we'll, we'll remember Christ. Now, let's, let's see if we have any. You know, here's a, good, uh, here's a good question. Somebody, people ask me this quite a bit. What's a good book to do uh, uh, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic uh, studies while reading the Bible? All right, here's a book. Jot this down. It's, it's actually a Bible. It's called the, um, the Hebrew Greek Key, K-E-Y, Study Bible. The Hebrew Greek Key Study Bible. This is how I started out. It's by a man, edited by a man named Spiros, S-P-I-R-O-S, Zotiates. 
I don't know how to spell that, just Z something, okay? Spiro Zodiates. Be, there's not too many spirits writing editorials on Bibles, okay? But it's the Hebrew Greek Key Study Bible. It's a great beginning if you want to just kind of get, get your feet into the Hebrew and Greek. What it'll do, like in the Old Testament, you'll be reading and it'll have a word underlined and a little number. And you look in the back of the Bible and it'll have that word in Hebrew and it kind of breaks it down for you. Uh, in the Greek New Testament, you'll see, again, same thing, a key word that is underlined. It'll have a number. You look up the number, and it'll give you the Greek, or the, the, yeah, the Greek word and the meaning. So if you're kind of wanting to get a little bit deeper into the study of uh, the original languages, that's a great place to start. Uh, how often is it okay to take communion? Um, how often is it okay to take? It's a great question. Um, some people take communion every day. Smith Wigglesworth, y'all heard of him, the great Pentecostal pioneer? Smith Wigglesworth, there were seasons where he would take communion every single day. John Wesley, for seasons, would take it every single day. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with taking it every th single day. The thing you have to be careful of is famili familiarity breeds what? Contempt. So don't take it so often that you forget the power of it. But I, I, some people take it every day and... Um, I don't think there's a problem with that. Uh, and then the people do ask this. Now, look, you know, if I don't have uh, wine and if I don't have bread, can I do milk? Can I do cookies? Whatever. And I would just say that in a land of abundance, okay, we're not in a famine right now. You can probably get bread somewhere. Everybody can get bread somewhere and everybody can get juice somewhere. So let's just stick together with bread and juice, okay? Not wine, juice. Um, the, um, because, again, I'm afraid that if we let everything become communion, then it just loses its significance, right? All right, Cross family, what did you think about the teaching? Were you all in or did it raise some questions? Well, now it's time to go through it all and discuss and hopefully through great fellowship. I'll leave you in good hands and capable hands of the leaders and hope to see you at the next installment of our digital 242 series. Love y'all and God bless.